On Good Friday, we said that many people feel like they're in a tomb. Sometimes it's a tomb of despair. Sometimes it's a tomb of discouragement. Sometimes it's brought about because of our sinful, broken condition. Sometimes it's brought about because of what others have done to us. But many people feel as if they are in a tomb. And then Jesus, on Easter, comes into our own tomb and rescues us from that tomb. And that's the good news of Easter. But now, here's the question. If Jesus has rescued us from the tomb, why is it that there are times in our lives when we feel like we're still in the tomb? Why is it that there's times when we feel so discouraged and so beaten and so defeated and we're so scared if Jesus has been victorious? Well, now there's many reasons we talk about here all the time. There's many reasons why we, how we describe why the good person suffers. For one thing, God is, first of all, God is not the author of death. He's not the author of cancer. He's not the author of, of war. Uh, whatever you can name along those lines, God is not the author of those things. But they come about for two reasons. Number one, he gave you and me a free will, and sometimes we use it against him, and sometimes we harm other people. And because of our free will, sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, it ushered in a, a, a whole league of, of issues in our life, from, from sin and death and, and disease to war and hate. All of that got ushered in. And so God became a man in Jesus to do battle with all of those things. God could have prevented all of them from happening, but he would have had to make us a robot. So then we could still ask, but then... What does the victory of Jesus mean? Well, we've said this before, and it's worth repeating, that, you know, in any war, there's a point, a tipping point, a turning point, where we know who the victor will be. In World War II, for example, the experts say it was at the Battle of the Bulge, that that's where it was, it was understood who the victor would be. It'd be the Allied forces and not the Axis powers. And our generals knew it. President Roosevelt knew it. That that, at that point, we knew who the victor would be. Now, does that mean the bombs stopped falling and the bullets stopped flying? No, they did. They kept going. The war kept going. People kept dying until its very end. But we knew who the victor would be, and that is very, very important. And so here, too, Easter tells us we know who the victor is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the victor over sin and death and the grave. And so his resurrection is this tipping point, this turning point where we know who the victor will be. Now, many of you sometimes, many of you have probably seen on television uh, demolition derbies. Have you ever seen those on TV, you know? I heard somebody talking about it recently, and they said that, uh, you know, the way this works is that these cars smash into each other like these right here. They smash into each other, and the last car that can run is the winner. Dubious distinction. And... Uh, but then I also learned that inside the car, in the door, they tape a stick to the door. They duct tape a stick to the door. And if somebody gets to the point where they can't take it anymore, the driver, he's a little woozy from being beat around, uh, or his car isn't running anymore, he doesn't want to get hit anymore, he takes the duct tape off the stick and he puts it out the window, and that's the declaration, I quit. One guy I heard about, he stuck that out the window, and they still kept hitting him, and he got a little angry said some mean things to those other drivers. Well, maybe you feel like you've been in a demolition derby in your life, and you've raised the stick, and you still keep on getting pounded. I've invited Paul Liu to join me this morning. Paul's been with us in all the services. Come on up, Paul. And uh, Paul's becoming a good friend to Mount of Islands here. And... Uh, He's been with me last night for the Saturday service and this morning for the first service this morning. And so I know your story, Paul, and uh, I know that you've been in a demolition derby for a long time. Yes, we have. And, you know, we, we sometimes say we're, we're in these derbies and we don't, we don't have the right gear. We don't have a helmet, but we're getting hit every day. <laughs> so what's your story? What's happened to you? Yeah. Well, for us, um, 
Our story started about uh, 10 years ago uh, with, with our oldest daughter. She, uh, she was a senior at University of California, Irvine, about to graduate and uh, preparing herself to go off to med school. You know, all parents would be elated uh, with news like that. And uh, somehow she couldn't uh, graduate. She, her last semester, uh, she had few classes she couldn't complete. So we had to go back and do it again and again. And we think, you know, we, we were thinking, okay, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's stress, maybe there's too much going on. She needs to figure out what to do. You know, we're thinking, you know, it's just, you know, related to her and, you know, all of her ambitions and all the stress related with that. And she needs time. Um, but uh, but it, it, the, the story changed a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember coming down to the kitchen uh, one morning and I opened the cupboard and, and the cupboard looked like, you know, World War III has gone through it. And, you know, I went to my wife and said, hey, you, did you, did you see this? And she's going, and I'm going, did you, know, did you do this? I go, no. So we're thinking, okay, well, what happened? And then our daughter came down and said, you know, uh, I came down last night and, you know, the cupboard was not very well organized. So I decided to reorganize the cupboard. And that's when we, we kind of finally came to some, some kind of an idea that something was not right. But still, we, we didn't know what, what it is, what it was. Um, and then, you know, she kind of, you know, did some things that uh, she probably shouldn't have done. And she wind up kind of getting herself in trouble. And then, you know, one day, you know, we had a, what's called the crisis intervention team come to our home. And they, uh, you know, decided that it was time to take her to get some help. And then the doctors told us that, you know, she had bipolar. And we had no idea what bipolar meant. Uh, and, and, you know, the doctors told us what it is and, you know, what we needed to do. And uh, when, when we left, we, we were basically in denial. Uh, and so was our daughter. She didn't think there was anything wrong, and we didn't think there was anything wrong. And we kept thinking, well, this is something we can fix. You know, we can do this. You know, dads wants to fix things, so I can fix this. It's, it's, you know, I got the easy button. I can fix this. And then after a while, the reality came that, you know, we can't fix this. Uh, it's not something that, you know, we can fix. And that, that kind of was like a turning point for us. Um, and our lives um, started to become like in limbo. We didn't know what was going to happen next. We had no idea what's ahead. And we started to, to have guilt. We started to feel shame. Uh, we wanted to keep it a secret, especially away from the church. We did not want people at church to know that this was going on because we were fearful that, you know, the church was going to, you know, judge us. They're going to say, oh, you, you guys did something wrong and, you know, <laughs> are, are you being punished? And, 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 and it wasn't, wasn't good. It was a lot of guilt. And, and that caused a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And there were also times when we, we all kind of experienced some trauma in our lives because of what was going on. And, and to the point where our faith was challenged, and was challenged significantly. Um, you know, we kept thinking, okay, God's punishing us. You know, he, he's, he's really levying some serious pain on us. And uh, it must be something that we did, must have been something that we said, must have been something that we didn't do. Um, so, so it was hard. It, it was hard to, to the point where, you know, we're saying, geez, you know, what is church? And, and you know, why is this happening? Uh, but, but through it all, I, I kept thinking, you know, God, Jesus is, is there. God's there. We just need to somehow, you know, remind ourselves of that. And, and one Bible verse that always comes to me is Matthew 11, 28. That says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And, and that's, you know, when we put the stick up. <laughs> we need help today. We're, we're going to need some help to get through today. We're, this is you know, just 6 o'clock in the morning, and we got a long ways to go. I'm, I'm going to need some help. And, and we, we, uh, we started thinking that way. Um, and then we came across this organization called NAMI, 
which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we started taking classes that's offered by NAMI to try to help family members and others on, number one, understanding what is this sickness that we call mental illness, and how, how does this happen, uh, and, and what, what we can do as family members, as parents, and thing, things that we can do to help. And, and this was really very, very helpful for us to the point where my wife says, you know, we need to volunteer. And we, we need to help other people that are kind of, you know, in the same situation because look what this has done for us. So we wind up, you know, becoming volunteers. I, and I wind up volunteering for uh, this, this uh, uh, for FaithNet, which is the, the faith-based component of NAMI. Uh, which is, uh, you know, what I do. And, you know, I, I go to uh, various faith organizations. I come to churches like this and, and, and tell, you know, tell my story. You know, because the reality is, you know, from what we learn from NAMI is, you know, one in five in the United States uh, suffer some form of mental illness in, in every year. Every given year, about one in five of us. So, uh, so we're not alone, uh, and, and we very quickly realize that you know, we're, we're not the only ones that are, are suffering. And, you know, and very likely, there are people kind of, you know, they may be like us a few years ago where we were like, we don't want to tell anybody because, you know, it's, it's wow, you know, our life is going to change. People are going to think different of us. So, so we, we started to, to do that. And, and recognizing that, you know, you know, God's there. Uh, and then we started thinking about, well, you know, the, can God really help with mental illness? You know, can, can God really be there for us, um, you know, when people have mental illness issues? So, um, so I, I read the, the message one day, and I came across this passage in Matthew 4.24. And it says, people brought anybody with an ailment, whether mental, emotional, or physical, Jesus healed them, one and all. So as I read them, I'm like, whoa, okay, I got this. You know, I think Jesus knows how to deal with this. We just have to trust him. We, we've got to believe that he, he's going he's gonna to he's gonna be there for us. You know, I mean, he, he's, he, he's told us to go to him and, and he's going to give us rest. He's going to help us out. When, when we put the stick up and say, not today, <laughs> we need some help. Uh, Jesus is going to be there for us. So, so we, we find a lot of comfort knowing that, you know, Jesus is there and there is always hope through God. So uh, this is why, you know, uh, I, I do what I do now. So thank you. Thank you for your time. I wanted Paul. I wanted Paul to share this because one of the great problems in treating and dealing with mental health issues is the stigma that's attached to it. Tremendous stigma of shame and guilt. I mean, I often say, I'm I'm not proud to say it, but I mean I I well in a way I am. That I've been through two episodes of clinical depression myself. And so we, we've got to get around the shame issue so that we can really help people. It's the biggest problem in dealing with mental health issues is the shame and the guilt, the stigma. So we've got to get around that. And that's why I wanted Paul here. One of the reasons, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and tell your own story, doesn't it? And then he's going to be back with us on May 9th at 7 o'clock in the New Creation Center and uh, sharing a, a little class with us on mental illness and the church. And I hope you'll be there. And if you've got friends that need to hear this and need resources, there's also a table out in the courtyard today. Paul will be there. He's got somebody from NAMI there as well. They've got literature and material that you can have. We're here. We want to be a resource and a place where, where it's okay to have problems and it's okay to ask for help and that we're going to love you no matter what. So thank you, Paul. Give him a big round of applause. In the book of Acts, there's the story of a man by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He is a religious leader in the time. It's after the resurrection of Jesus. And he and others believe that Christians are, are blaspheming God. That's a high sin, worthy of death. 
And so he gets commissioned to go around killing Christians. And one day he's on a road to Damascus and uh, to kill Christians, and he's knocked to the ground and blinded, and here's a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you that I should persecute you? He said, I am Jesus. And he tells him who he is. Saul would later be baptized, and the Bible says scales fell from his eyes, and he became a new man. So much a new man that he became one of the great evangelists of the church, starting churches all through Asia Minor, wrote a majority of the New Testament, prolific writer, uh, and the greatest theologian that the church probably has or ever will have. Now, you'd think somebody like that, who's being greatly used by God, would have a rosy life, wouldn't you? You'd think everything would be just going swell for him. I mean, he's doing exactly what God has asked him to do, and you'd think everything's going his way. Well, here's what he had to say about that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes these words. He says, Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. He says, a thorn was given to him in the flesh. A messenger of Satan, by the way. So once again, it appears we really are in a war. And this thorn in the flesh doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. And we don't even know what it is. It's a thorn in the flesh, he calls it. Theologians for years have speculated as to what it is. Some think it's epilepsy, uh, that he uh, had epilepsy and that he had fits of epilepsy and that uh, people who were with him would be embarrassed like John Mark. John Mark left him on one of the uh, missionary journeys. We don't know exactly why. Some have speculated it was because of epilepsy. Some have speculated it was because he had bad eyesight, was maybe going blind. Because at one point he writes a letter to a church and he says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you. So maybe he's going blind or maybe he's just being a typical pastor who uh, likes to be bold in proclamation, yell and scream on paper and a large print. Or maybe he's going blind. We, he ne we never know. We never understand what it is. It's almost like you could fill in the blank. And maybe that's what you and I ought to do. We ought to Fill in the blank about this thorn in the flesh. It could be addiction. It could be mental health issues. It could be cancer. It could be any number of things, the, a marital crisis, a family crisis. It could be a many number of things, this thorn in the flesh. And then he says this, I prayed three times that it would leave. Prayed three times. Maybe you've prayed 3,000 times. I prayed three times that it would leave, and God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. You see what this means for us in our lives is that because Jesus Christ has conquered the grave, he promises to walk with us. He promises not to not abandon us or, or leave us, that his grace will go with us. His grace is his strength, and that will sustain us. And he promises to not abandon us. And when he comes again and establishes his kingdom forever, it won't be cancer that wins. It won't be mental illness that wins. It won't be addiction that wins. It'll be Jesus because we know who the victor will be. And so now as we walk, we see moments of, of healing. We see moments of restoration. The Bible calls those the first fruits of the resurrection. We see those things happening. It's early spring. It's early spring, not just here, but in our, this spiritual war. It's early spring. We know who the victor will be. And God says, hang in there. I'm not going to abandon you. My grace is sufficient for you. Brennan Manning, the famous uh, writer, former Roman Catholic priest, uh, in one of his books he tells the story about uh, John Cavanaugh. John Cavanaugh was a man who was struggling 
He wanted clarity about what he ought to do with his life. He wanted to know what he ought to do with the, the second half of his life. He was confused. He was struggling with figuring this out, praying about it. So he decided to travel to Calcutta and to work for three months with Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa runs an orphanage there, or did in the day when she was alive, and ran an orphanage helping these orphans that were in the, the most dire poverty you can imagine. Sickness and death reigned everywhere. Mother Teresa is one of the great heroes of our time. And he went to meet with Mother Teresa after he got there, and he said, she said, what can I do for you? And he says, you can pray for me. She says, for what can I pray? He says, pray that I have clarity. He said, I won't. I won't pray for that. You won't pray for that? Why won't you pray for that? She says, because you've been clinging to clarity. And that's not what you need. He says, but you seem to have such clarity. She laughed and said, I don't have clarity. But what I do have is trust. I trust God. And I will pray that you learn to trust God. And that's the message for us. When we're in that demolition derby, when we're getting beat up all over the place, he says, listen, my grace is sufficient. I will see you through this. I will not abandon you. Easter means that God has not forgotten you and has not abandoned you and will not walk away from you. And he says there will be someday, somewhere, somehow, a resurrection for you. My grace is sufficient. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today that your resurrection means that we know who the victor will be. We're even seeing now the first fruits of the resurrection. But Lord, you remind us again and again through your resurrection that you will not abandon us, you will not walk away from us, you will not ignore us or forget us, but that you will walk with us through the challenges and the disappointments and the heartache that we encounter. And that, Lord, you promise somewhere, somehow, there will be a resurrection for us too. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.